Hi, I'm Alistair and I have the privilege of sharing the Seagate devotionals every day this week. Uh, my theme this week centres on some of the very special religious objects I'm surrounded by here in my study from, from where I'm, I'm speaking. And today I want to talk about the family Bible. And here is the family Bible very substantial <laughs> book indeed and we'll sit it here where again you may just get a sight of the, the top of it. Uh, the family bible has now sat in my study just in the unit behind me here for 11 years. So how did it come to be here? I brought it from South Africa 11 years ago this very month I was visiting my only sister, Senga, in Cape Town. I hadn't seen her in many years and I suspected she was terminally ill. She died one month after my visit, age 63. Senga was a force of nature. She was three years and one day older than me. She trained as a nurse and as a midwife, but was called by God to Congo in Africa, which was then called Zaire, where she literally worked in the jungle as a midwife for 10 years in a very isolated spot. Because of danger and political uncertainty, she subsequently moved to South Africa, where she continued to serve God in the Evangelical Mission Press in Belleville in Cape Town. It was here she would meet and marry her husband, Bob. It was in one of her visits home to Scotland that she and Bob had taken the family Bible to South Africa. Life over her last 12 years was a roller coaster for her. She had gone to donate blood and only then learned that she had a real health problem. She was subsequently diagnosed with hepatitis C which moved to cirrhosis of the liver, ultimately cancer, uh, from which she finally died. She almost certainly picked up hepatitis C when serving the Lord in Congo through infected blood. Now, I knew Senga had been seriously unwell before my visit, but death was not mentioned. It wasn't mentioned even during the 10 days I spent with Senga and Bob in 2009. But when she gave me the family Bible and she also gave me her nursing gold medal from 1966 and said, I want you to take these home, I realised it was only a matter of time. So how to bring the much travelled family Bible home? I packed it in my backpack. It's substantially heavy. Senga and Bob dropped me at the airport in Cape Town for my flight home to Heathrow, London. Going through security, I was stopped by a huge black and I confess very intimidating security guard. Unsmiling face. What have you got in the backpack, sir? A Bible, I said. Let me see it. He in turn then opened the Bible and started turning to some of his favourite passages with a huge smile on his face. I'm a Christian, sir. I can still remember the queue behind me waiting impatiently as the security guard and I shared our faith stories. And so the family Bible found its way home to Scotland and my study where it has been for these last 11 years. So whose Bible was it originally? Well, it was my great-grandfather's on my mother's side, a man called Isaac McMillan, who lived in Colburn near Lismahago. And I learned a lot from reading the family register inside. I learned that he was born on October the 27th, 1849. He had recorded that. But then he wrote this, Isaac McMillan, new birth, born 4th April 1880. He was born again and his conversion was very important to him to the extent that he recorded it in the family Bible. Born again, aged 30. 
My grandmother features in the Bible. She was the, the youngest, the fourth child uh, of her parents, and she was born on the 30th of April, 1889. Uh, she was my mother's mother, after whom my sister Senga was named. My, my grand's name was Agnes. And those of you who know the sort of background to Scotland will know that Senga is Agnes backwards. What comes next in the family Bible is very illuminating and important. He records family worship in the family Bible, where the family would meet together to pray and to read. And he, re he wrote these exact words, night and morning, beginning March 1st, 1895, to keep a record of time and also how often we read through the Bible in its entirety. In 1902, in November, he records they had read through the Bible five times. On the 10th of February 1909, they had read through the Bible ten times. And he put the subheading, Praise the Dear Lord. Then he wrote, Family worship continued until September 1917. Now, this is in the middle of the First World War. And he wrote this, this makes 15 times we praise the Lord for his goodness. That's during the First World War. Uh, we moan and groan a bit about lockdown and coronavirus. And then he, he wrote this, which I, I found, well, I, I confess I'm using. He said, after recording they had read it 15 times, I am getting old and full of years, aged 69. <laughs> I'm uh, 72 next month uh, and I don't feel old and full of years, but it was a different generation. And then the very last entry in the family Bible is this. 19 times. I am now 74 on the 27th of October. They had read through the Bible 19 times. Now I'm really touched by the fact that this man brought up his family to read the Bible and worship the Lord. His daughter Agnes, my grandmother, was born again, and in turn, my mother Christine was born again. And in due course, I was led to faith in the Lord Jesus by my mother as a boy of six in Burnbank. Is this where my love of God's word began? Paul writes in Second Timothy, I thank God whom I serve as my ancestors did with a clear conscience, as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers, recalling your tears. I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. And then he says this, I am reminded of your sincere faith, Timothy, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. I think you can understand why this family Bible is special and why bringing up our children to know God and to know God's word is the most important gift we can give them. Even our national bard Robert Burns acknowledged this and I confess my favourite Burns poem calls uh, The Cotter's Saturday Night and a couple of verses from it in conclusion. The cheerful supper done with serious face, they round the ingle, the fireside, form a circle wide. The sire turns roar with patriarchal grace, the big haw Bible, the family Bible. Once his father's pride, his bonnet reverently is laid aside, his lyart halfets, sideburns wearing thin and bare. Those strains that once did sweet in Zion gloud, he wails a portion with judicious care. And let us worship God, he says, with solemn air. And the poem goes on to recount what took place. And then Burns writes this. From scenes like these old Scotia, Scotland, from scenes like these old Scotia's grandeur springs that makes her loved at home revered abroad. Princes and lords are but the breath of kings. An honest man's the noblest work of God. And certes in fair virtue's heavenly road, the cottage leaves the palace far behind. What is a lordling's pomp? A cumbrous load, disguising off the wretch of humankind, studied in arts of hell and wickedness 
refined. Our religious object today is the family Bible. Uh, let us value and love and revere the Word of God. A prayer. Father, we do thank you for your Word. We thank you for the people who have valued it and brought it to us. And I just want to thank you for, for Grandpa Isaac McMillan and for my grandmother Agnes and for my mother Christine and for the faith that they shared down the family line and a faith which now I enjoy personally. And Lord, I want to thank you for this family Bible, for the memories it invokes. And just to recall, Lord, that that this is no mere book. <laughs> it's no mere family Bible. This, this very book is the Word of God. Lord, help us as your people here in Seagate to, to love it and to treasure it and to read it and to share it. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Bye. God bless.